two more to go. Yeah. So trade-related intellectual property rights, uh, the TRIPS agreement, um, which recharacterized or led to the ability for uh, for seed ownership to be re or seeds to be recharacterized as a commodity that could be owned uh, by a company like Monsanto. If they mix their labor with it, if they change it in some way through uh, scientific or technological research uh, that changes the seed in some way, even some some minuscule way, then they can own it. And then then you cannot uh, trade it, uh, or you can you cannot reuse it unless you have permission. Um, and just a few other nefarious things about that. Uh, Farmers are getting uh, sued as a result of this, but that's um, that's that's one thing. That's a big thing. But um, but the other things we've talked about in terms of like monocropping, putting all of one seeds in one basket, um, threatening biodiversity for the future. We're losing uh, these traditional seeds, and that is a huge, huge problem when we think about the future in 10 years and 20 years when these things are might be being successful right now. Like uh, like uh, what's your name? Yeah. Like Al said, uh, cease to be uh, successful, and then Monsanto is even doing more nefarious things. I mean, these are all nefarious things, but uh, uh, the idea of Terminator seeds, something that they were investing in years ago, and then they said they stopped it, and then recently they've been saying, "Oh no, we've always been going forward with this technology." What a Terminator seed is is one that uh, doesn't doesn't pollinate, and so it will not be able to be used a second year. So they don't have to sue farmers anymore because the farmers can't reuse the seeds. Seeds will become perfected as a commodity when seeds, just as a general understanding of what they are, something that reproduces, something that you can reuse, something that's a gift from the land. For instance, in India, um, the neem seed um, has was tried to uh, attempt, Monsanto attempted to commodify, uh, commoditize this and claimed ownership because of a tiny change that they'd made. They lost the lawsuit, but the irony is that neem means uh, free seed uh, in India. The, the funny thing about that is, like e evolution needs that that um, genetics, uh, um, not modified genetics, but. Uh, genetics in general to move forward with evolution for things to change for things to adapt and uh, by using that type of seed that kind of yeah it, it kind of stops evolution it, in its tracks yes. it's uh, like I've grown like them huge pumpkins of several hundred or even over a thousand pound pumpkins and all that was done through um, genetics by crossing crossing plants with certain characteristics, not by messing with the gene itself, but just by uh, the, the traits and the characteristics that you want to see in your plant or vegetable or whatever. And uh, I don't know, there seems there should be a lot more attention toward that and less of this uh, corporation takeover of our seeds, our food, our, uh -huh. our like, like you said, the bottom cropping. It's, I've lived in Ohio and just seen thousands of acres of just corn and soybeans, that's all you see down there is just corn and soybeans. And I actually made a pretty decent living selling peppers and lettuce because nobody else was doing it. They were all commercial farms uh, growing soy and, and corn. You know. I'm but, from uh, Iowa. And, uh, yeah, so ubiquitous cornfields everywhere. Corn um, no fences anymore because you don't have family farm plots that are fenced between each other. You just have a large cornfield that goes on for miles. Uh, but just to wrap up this section, um, the, the main thing that um, will be said in, ter uh, in favor of the green revolution, uh, the cap the increased yield uh, through chemical use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides following World War II, as you pointed out, uh, use employing in a lot of times uh, technology uh, uh, developed um, and refined and used during World War II um, as, a, as a weapon. Uh, uh, the, the main thing that, that we said in response is, well, we have been very, very successful with increasing yields. First of all, what we need to say to that is, that uh, the, it's up for debate whether or not yield has been increased. But what isn't up for debate, following uh, uh, what is up for debate, is that uh, increased yields over the last half century have not led to e increased uh, distribution of, of food uh, to people that need it. And uh, to quote Am 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 Amiyarta Sen, uh, Starvation is the characteristic of people not having enough food to eat. It's not the characteristic of there not being enough food, not being enough food to eat. Um, so this is largely a distribution problem. Um, I, I think the jury is really still out about whether through bioregional uh, 
food production, um, we can we can feed ourselves or be sustainable. I think I think it uh, is possible that it could be, um, although slightly more labor intensive, and what do we have an excess of right now, but a uh, labor supply. Uh, that we can, we can feed ourselves in a way that doesn't have to have recourse to these uh, food giants. Um, but regardless, the food distribution problem uh, marks that this is a, a failed system. And the threats in terms of biodiversity and putting all of our eggs in one basket um, also highlight this is a horrible problem. The second issue uh, that I was want to, uh, I just gonna introduce and then I will explain it in terms of the uh, problem for capitalism that I think that it uh, highlights is global climate change. Um, First of all, uh, the mitigation efforts for global climate change, the attempts to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions, have, we all know, been completely unsuccessful. We can't reach intergovernmental inter, uh, agreement, mostly because the major polluters, America and China, and now Canada is backed out, um, are not going to reach a binding agreement. And the agreements that have been reached are all of the sort of, by, say, 2020 or 2050, we, need, we will reach, uh, we will cut back emissions to say pre-1990s levels. But that's, but take that as an analogy, take, that, take this to an, as an analogy to uh, how much coffee I drink is an example I like to use. If I drink three cups of coffee a day and I tell you, don't worry about it, I'm cutting back, I know it's bad for my health. So by 2020, I will cut back to one cup of coffee a day. If I don't do anything to curb my, my use in that time period, I haven't really cut any emissions in that period. All I have is a promise of some future cut. But mitigation, um, uh, first of all, it hasn't, it hasn't happened. Um, but second of all, um, it's too late, probably, to curb the worst effects um, of, uh, global, of, uh, that we're gonna be facing in terms of global climate change. Uh, um, expect, um, analysts expect that when the IPCC releases its next international uh, uh, panel on climate change releases its uh, next report 2014 that it will show that um, there's no way that we can uh, stay under two degree temperature increase and that is what across the board scientists have said is the is the minimum safe target or the maximum safe target that we can cope with without dramatic changes so with business as usual which is still going on because the only way that we can curb emissions in um, our economic system is situations uh, means that with business as usual these are going to be much higher than we uh, 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 than, than we could possibly have hoped for um, and as a result of that um, um, we're gonna live in a world where uh, climate uh, climate adaptation uh, climate uh, uh, refugees are, are things that we have to face in terms of like the Maldivian population maybe perhaps needing to be relocated, um, uh, polar ice caps melting and uh, ocean acidification, the frequency of extreme events. So you can't talk about it uh, in terms of it's a hot day, it's uh, a direct result of global climate change. But what you can say is that the frequency of, of, of extreme event um, is, is uh, increased because of global climate change. So uh, uh, a freak event that would happen every 100 years, now say it could happen every 50 years or something like that. Um, migration of vector-borne diseases um, has increased, like dengue and malaria. Um, dry, drying rivers, like Lake Mead, Nevada and Arizona. Massive crop failures, coral reefs, massive coral reef die-offs. Um, and more uh, even more importantly, um, all of these things are the result of uh, largely uh, anthropogenic problems, things that we've done um, in terms of um, em uh, human emissions, uh, methane and, uh, and, and uh, fossil fuels. Um, but um, they're also correlated with positive feedback, what's called positive feedback loops. Um, that are going to um, are natural are, are natural natural releases of greenhouse gas emissions that are the uh, end or end of temperature rises um, that are the result of these anthropogenic changes. Uh, two examples are the albedo effect, uh, which um, is like a black t-shirt effect in a hot day, where it takes uh, more of the heat in and it doesn't reflect more of it back off into the atmosphere again. So you have. Um, 
when the uh, with the polar ice melt, it it, uh, it leaves uh, darker surfaces, which are which are uh, leading to more of the sun's rays.